This episode of the Better Every Shift podcast is brought to you by Lexipol, the experts in policy, training, wellness support, and grants assistance for first responders and government leaders. To learn more, visit lexipol.com. That's L-E-X-I-P-O-L.com. Now let's get into the show. everybody, welcome to the Better Every Shift podcast. My name is Aaron Zamzow. I'm a firefighter training officer from Madison, Wisconsin. With me as always is the uh, editor-in-chief. I call her the, the captain, the corporal, the, the brains behind the organization here, Janelle Fasquette. Janelle, how are you today? I am doing fantastic. How are you doing, Zam? I'm great. I'm, I'm obviously very excited, as you can always tell. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about safety which uh, for any firefighter can sometimes uh, bring uh, both uh, joy and pain. But I think with our guest today, it's going to be very pleasurable and it's going to be very informative. We have with us Chief Darren Wallentine. Chief, how are you? Thank you for being here. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me and uh, looking forward to, uh, to talking about safety stand down this year. Well, you're on the IFC's safety, health and survival section, which is one of safety stand downs partners. You're, you're also... Uh, the deputy fire chief with Sarasota County Fire Department, Florida. You were previously a chief uh, for 25 years in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and you were talking a little bit about your transition down into Sarasota County. You kind of came at a, a very trying time. There were some issues with some construction and then there's obviously the storms. And so uh, here you are through all those uh those, those turbulent times to be with us and, and appreciate you, you being here. How has it been so far uh, with the new role that there in Sarasota County? Well, it's been um, tremendously rewarding and fantastic uh, from the time that we arrived back in July last year. Um, my wife and I were looking for, a, for an opportunity to be closer to family, which was living on the East Coast. And when Sarasota County um, was uh, looking for their next deputy fire chief, um, I jumped at the offer. So I was uh, had a tremendous opportunity to move here and uh, be with this uh, amazing department. And so we're, when I moved here, we were just two, two to three months in. And next thing you know, I'm experiencing my first hurricane. So, <laughs> so we got activated here in the EOC that I'm currently, uh, uh, you know, talking with you uh, from. And so I spent uh, about uh, a good two weeks in this uh, building uh, as we were uh, managing the response for Hurricane Ian. And you, we were talking about your backdrop, which is, is great. And it's kind of like one of those you adapt and you overcome, right? You said, hey, I, I, I'm going to be, doing, if I have some of these podcasts and things to do, you found a couple of flags that were laying, that were, they weren't laying around, but they were at various spots. You're like, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. make this my little makeshift office. And uh, it looks great, by the way. It looks like yeah. angels wings back there. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I had to go over to our press room and, uh, and move the flags. And uh, because at the current time, I don't have an office because of some uh, leaky roofs, uh, you know, uh, where my current office uh, was located before, but that's all getting fixed. And uh, hopefully we'll be back in our, our admin building soon, but uh, for now, uh, we have temporary uh, fire headquarters. Yep. We just adapt. adapt. Yep. Adapt, adapt and, overcome. And, and overcome. And speaking of that safety standout now, uh, you know, look at the fire service. We uh, have various things that we try to, to uh, incorporate in and themes uh, to help us adapt and overcome and safety stand down, I think is one of the great things that has come from uh, a collaboration of a lot of different organizations uh, for, for our listeners, just um, that maybe don't know, give us a 30 second, like, kind of elevator pitch of, of 10,000 foot, like what is safety stand down and what is it all about? So safety stand down, we take one week out of the year, uh, the third week in June. So this year it's going to be June 18th through the 24th, where we take a specific topic for the fire service that's related to safety and related to um, training and education for our firefighters. This year, our topic is lithium ion batteries are you ready? This is a tremendous uh, opportunity for us to not only learn more about the technology that we're running up against in first response, you know, to these incidents. And it doesn't matter if it's um, EVs, um, uh, emergency storage systems, um, just all these different types of, of 
ways that lithium ion batteries are now finding their way into uh, our daily lives. So we're providing the background and information over five days, which will have topics. And then we are asking our firefighters to suspend or alter their normal work week so that they can set aside time so that they can learn about lithium ion batteries, the types of incidents that they could be running into, and then also ways that they can protect themselves and each other uh, as we respond to these very challenging events. Yeah, so it's a way for departments and, and really the fire service just to say, hey, let's quick, quick step back, look at this obvious hazard that's uh, in front of us and has been for a while. Now, all of a sudden, it's starting to snowball into uh, you, you're seeing kind of more and more uh, kind of catastrophic calls because of these different batter batteries. So it's a way for all of us to to kind of come together, provide uh, what Safety Stand Down does is, is provided provides those resources. And then um, uh, we try to just disseminate them and, and talk about it, right? Where's the, where's the, what's the best place to go to for any, any department or firefighter wanting to participate? So you're going to go to safetystanddown.org and that's going to take you to the, the website that um, the IAFC, uh, National Volunteer Fire Council, NFPA, the Fire Department Safety Officers Association, and our newest partner, uh, the IAFF. We all have uh, partners coming from each of these agencies that have now taken and put together plans for the week for days to review all different types of topics, resources that are available for firefighters to review, case studies, ways that they can uh, prepare for that next incident that they might run into, um, and really uh, a test of knowledge where we have a, a quiz that we'll have everybody do um, both before, and we encourage people to take the quiz after to see the improvement in the, the knowledge base based on the information that we put out there for them. Really, this week is designed to, to give the tools to the firefighters, the company officers, the chief officers, and then also to our fire chiefs around the country, because we can't scroll through social media without seeing the next video of a mobility device plugged in near someone's front door and next thing you know it fails creating this almost rocket type of an explosion that you know even i mean i think there were more than 200 you know uh, lithium ion battery related fires in new york last year killing you know handful of people and injuring more than 100 and 140 people so it's it is a challenge for all of our firefighters uh, but we're just looking to put the tools you know in their hands understand what you know the response is like and then the best way to approach it both in an operational setting but then also in post incident considerations and then ultimately public education if we can educate our our uh, community leaders and our communities themselves they can prevent potentially these these deadly incidents from occurring in the first place. Now, this is obviously a huge topic right now. You just listed off some major fires we've been seeing in the news. I mean, here at Fire Rescue One, I, I think we're posting something about a lithium ion battery fire, you know, at least once a week, it feels like it's, it's just such a huge issue. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at coming up with the themes for each year with the safety stand down, I mean, certainly this one feels particularly relevant with what's going on. There are other years where the themes are, you know, very important, but they're a little bit more high level. This one's a little bit more operational and very specific. Can you kind of share a little bit of what goes into those discussions about selecting the theme sort of, you know, peek behind the curtain, if you will, like of how those discussions play is one, one person responsible or one group responsible for picking the theme or is it the whole, the whole um, group of partners together? So, so Janelle, I, that's a great question. Um, how we arrived at the uh, decision to um, go for one more operational in our um, approach this year, 
the the topic of lithium ion batteries it's it's a little bit interesting backstory to that about two years ago uh chief nate trauernick um, who was the lead for safety stand down in the last several years uh contacted me having been an additional board member you know with the safety health and survival section and asked if i would take the lead from him so i kind of mirrored him last year on our situational awareness topic with uh, Dr. Richard Dassaway. Previous years, we had, you know, uh, rehab, you know, at the fire scenes. Um, traffic incident management was another topic for roadways. But interestingly enough, about the same time, about two years ago, I was a part of our board, being a new board member, wanting to do it all, um, was asked if I would be a um, safety, health, and survival section representative on Chief Michael O'Brien's um, subcommittee for lithium-ion batteries. And so Chief O'Brien and I had been partnering with the, the fire and life safety section, as well as the safety, health, and survival section to have all of the subject matter experts develop one-pagers for the mobility devices, EVs, ESS. And so as the stars aligned, when, when I was then meeting with um, our partners for the safety stand down committee, it, we, we had talked about a few different topics, but when I presented the opportunity to take the information that Chief O'Brien and his committee had been working on and now going across the country talking about and discussing lithium ion batteries and the challenges i it, it seemed to click with the committee that that this was a very relevant recent and important topic that um i know that whether you're with the iafc iaff or national volunteer fire council or fire department safety Office association it's they get regular and frequent questions and needs for resources. And the NFPA is also gathering all of those resources as well to respond to all of the needs that departments across the country are facing on lithium ion batteries. I know that there's, there's places across the country now that are building these huge buildings that are either recycling batteries or building batteries, and it is in our backyard. And we as fire service leaders have to come up with a plan and that's what we're hoping to achieve. And so that, that initial connection with the subcommittee for the lithium ion battery response seemed to be the perfect segue for us with the safety stand down this year. Well, and I, I have to agree with your, your choice, just, um, you know, looking around at, uh, you know, Janelle mentioned just in the news, but also it, what really can hit home is if, as 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 you're listening to this, and this is to the listeners, just think about how many lithium ion lithium batteries you have in your house right now. Uh, just take a quick snapshot of of all of them. You know, phones, iPads, tools now are all. Uh, you you buy the kids a hoverboard. You know, grandma, grandpa got the uh, scooter. Um, uh, you know, anywhere from what twenty to forty. I and. Uh, and I don't know, Chief, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's probably about the average in most households is right around between that. Um, so all of them have to charge. All of them start to degrade over time. Uh, and this isn't even talking about automobiles. This is just general uh, batteries kind of uh, that, are, that are in households. And so you mentioned, uh, you know, we're looking at, and we're looking at the, the hazards that these batteries uh, have for fire, but then also if they are in a fire, correct? Like, how do we, um, you know, clean them up or, or, you know, when you look at overhaul, now this is a whole nother element, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's the, the firefighters, we, we, we seek the, you know, uh, what, what is going to help us get our job done? And, and I think that you'll hear from the subject matter experts and, and by all means, when I got started in this whole conversation about lithium ion batteries, I knew just enough to be dangerous. Um, and there are significantly smarter people, um, not only on my committee for safety stand down, but in these uh, technical committees 
for for lithium ion batteries. There is so much to know that um, our firefighters out there um, that you can't you, there there isn't enough water sometimes, you know. There's there's applications that we're thinking of operationally that we think that maybe foam would work or some of these other, you know, pool salts and and other things that people kind of come up with a way that they think are going to, you know, uh, mitigate these these emergencies. We're we're technology is is happening faster than the fire service can react. And so. So we're we're doing our very best to to come up with plans, um, you know, one pagers to give our our company officers out there at least an idea about how to approach these incidents. But really, water seems to be the the one thing that everybody is consistently responding to. That you you, you don't have enough water sometimes for mm-hmm. for the whether it's EVs or or some of the other the battery, you know. Um, large battery storage facilities that we encounter. And yeah. there's so many different hazards that come along with this. Now, also, uh, the gases, the off-gassing of some of these batteries now that uh, have gone through uh, the reaction. Um, you know, we, we talk about automobiles, uh, you know, you know that, that cloud or that smoke is now a lot more potent and hazardous to us uh, in an EV situation. And these are just things that we need to be aware of and and then obviously look at how we're going to as departments um operate around these things and it doesn't matter right uh, and i think that's the, the interesting part about this is you could be in a uh, urban rural it doesn't really matter volunteer we're all going to be exposed to this and they as you had said, stated earlier it's all in our backyard what was the biggest surprise when you started to dig into this a little bit more um you know out of out of all the different th- conversations you had and all, all the different experts you talked to, you know, is, was there one thing that you just went, Oh my gosh, this is, this is right here. Why we need to talk about it. Well, I mean, so living here in Sarasota County and, and I know it's this way across the country, um, you can't swing a stick without hitting a Tesla. And some of, one of the things that, that uh, our, our firefighters are, are looking to mitigate the hazard some of the initial conversations that we had about EVs is what pretty much the light bulb, you know, went on in my brain thinking, okay, this is a real issue. Um, talking about terminology like, like stranded energy or thermal runaway, or the fact that we have vehicles that can re- reignite 24 to 48 hours later as a result of that thermal runaway. Now we're running into issues where we're working with the towing companies, you know, the standards for our fire prevention bureaus for them to come up with, you know, the the policies and procedures for how we store EVs at a wrecking yard. Otherwise, you know, you're going to find that we're going to have these large, you know, incidents because of just the inherent dangers of lithium ion batteries. It, it was some of these things that was like, oh my goodness, this is even more of an issue than we even thought not to not to mention you know the exposure to our firefighters with some of these toxic gases a lot of a lot of my background has always been in the the cancer research and needing to wear your scba for longer periods of time just because the fire's out inside of a inside of a residence and you're starting to do overhaul that doesn't mean it's time to take the air pack off because that stuff is still off gassing and we're seeing that with the increased rates of cancer as a result of our firefighters who are in essence being exposed to to all of those toxins it's it's no different than when you're responding to a a fire when it's relating to a lithium ion battery specifically EVs and ESSs that it's even more so the case that our firefighters need to wear their protection which means wear your air pack longer we can continually refill bottles there's there's no there's no rush to take your your regulator off or take your air pack off when you're starting to do overhaul because it's still off gassing and it's still going to um, you know be a hazard to our our personnel. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I was just thinking about so we several weeks ago we had um, Captain Patrick Durham on the show talking about EV fires 
And he's written a lot for us on this topic. And one of his most popular articles on Fire Rescue One is called Where the Waiting Game Wins, because it's basically about, you know, that push and pull for firefighters. You want to start jumping water on, but sometimes you've got to just let it burn. And he kind of goes through sort of the continuum of um, of different extinguishment options. But I think it's really interesting that we've kind of transitioned from that. We, there was a lot of news about that, including one he wrote about Hurricane Ian and the, submer- the vehicles that have been submerged that yep. igniting after. It's all these little factors that you don't think about along the way that are creating such a hazard here. And now it's the e-bikes. Now we're seeing all the news about e-bikes. So it's just kind of like this never-ending situation, you know, a never-ending, uh, it's like the hazards that just keep unfolding. I guess, with this um, particular topic, which I just find really fascinating. Yeah, it's one of those, it's for all of the the ways that we're, you know, looking for alternative ways to to fuel our vehicles. And, and, you know, it's, it is a challenge for our fire service professionals to try to stay ahead of that curve. Because when you, you're now dealing with something that is entirely different, you're you have some different challenges you have different you know um you know uh, ways that that you have to stay up on the latest technology so so one of those additional partners that i know that multiple people have been you know making sure that we stay connected with is obviously the manufacturers the manufacturers of tesla or the the hybrids or the evs where where we we need to be you know uh, more um, knowledgeable about how to approach these. And oftentimes it's those manufacturers that are, you know, the best resources. And, and thinking about even, uh, you know, educating, not, not only the fire service, but let's look at our, you know, our constituents in the community, because what's going to happen. And, um, we've talked, we talked to Patrick about this as well, uh, was, you get these hoverboards, you get these e-bikes, or you get these uh, lithium-ion powered, um, uh, you know, saws and, and power tools. But what happens is eventually those batteries need to be um, recycled and 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 changed out. And if we don't have good quality batteries coming in, if people take shortcuts on that, that's where we see a real uh, danger, right? With, with third party and knockoff batteries. And and we know that that's about, co- that's coming in the door through various vendors. Um, and so this relates back to also creating an awareness and having our, our community members understand why it's better to, to invest a little bit more in quality, correct? Absolutely. Uh, that this even takes me back to a, a, um, at least a story that I heard on one of our committee meetings and the fact that we have a um, a potential for people to buy recycled batteries or batteries that have been damaged previously to be able to create their own, you know, storage system that they can put in their private residence. And we have firefighters who are responding to a to a, you know, house fire that they have no idea that the batteries that are that are even in this this residence. It's that as well as landfills, um, people disposing of these batteries in areas where they really shouldn't. Um, We've been, as part of the Safety Stand Down Committee, we have been approached by the Waste and Recycling Association to to work together, hopefully, fingers crossed, that we can uh, have a congressional resolution that uh, will come out from one of the House members and one of the senators that will highlight the urgency and the importance of lithium ion batteries and that they don't don't make it back into landfills or into areas where it's going to cause potential downstream effects that they're looking to to have us as partners not only to help promote safety stand down but also promote from the disposal side that that there are places that you can return and dispose of your lithium ion batteries as opposed for them going into the garbage chute or or going into the the landfills where we're now we're we're dealing with those large complex incidents at times 
Yeah, because they're putting us in, in danger. At, at, they're putting firefighters in danger. They're putting uh, any one of those workers uh, that you know is, that are, are working in the landfills in danger. Um, and, and 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 so the other part about this is you, we had mentioned like a, you know the Tesla that can start up on fire twenty four hours afterwards. We're getting we're going to see more rekindles, right? We're going to see ba- these batteries in fires all of a sudden through overhaul, through, uh, you know, all of the various, uh, fire ground operations, these batteries get buried, but that doesn't mean they're stopping the reactions. Correct. It, that, and so, that is correct. So we're going to start to see that number increase also. Yeah. So, so it's, it's not only the rekindles, but also the hazards to our, to our personnel. Again, like you mentioned, we respond to house fire and there could be anywhere from 40 plus, you know, lithium ion batteries that that could have been damaged as a result of, you know, um, whatever the incident could have uh, contributed to. And now we've got potential shock hazards to our personnel, uh, not not just the rekindles, but but also, again, that that off gassing where we could have somebody thinking that it is cleared out, it's aired out. But uh, because of the, the presence of these, these devices, they could still be off-gassing, causing toxic um, fumes to, to our fire cause investigators and those who are going through that uh, ongoing overhaul process. And, you know, before we get into some of the potential training opportunities for firefighters, in addition to some of those safety hazards you mentioned, I just want to highlight as well, in addition to the partners uh, that you mentioned that are part of this uh, program, um, lithium ion battery safety is also the June theme for the Fire and Life Safety Communicators Initiative through the USFA this month. So if you are interested, if you're for any fire departments looking for messaging to the community. Obviously there's two different things happening here in terms of the firefighter safety, but also messages that they're sharing with the community. Um, There are a lot of really great um, messages and resources on their website as well. Um, I will put those in our, our show notes as well. Yeah, looking at the website too, from a training officer standpoint, uh, you know, my next question has to has to deal with, all right, what are your favorite resources that that are up there? What are the what are the must sees and the must go tos that are on there? Now, there's so much there. Uh, there's there's sample um, SOGs and SOPs. There are some really great, uh, like you call hot washes, that talk about um, a particular topics, so like e-mobility devices, RC battery fires. Um, there's also just, uh, you know, obviously a, a bunch of stuff from UL and on, on, um, battery safety and electric vehicles. Um, my gosh, it, it, like there is, there's more than a week here. That's for sure. So where <laughs> should, where should somebody start? So I will say that, uh, when we first started talking about this topic to be a part of safety stand down, one of our biggest challenges was trying to narrow it down into a bite-sized per day amount of information that that we can you know put into the into the minds and the hands of our of our firefighters so i would say first to start off is that we have five days of topics uh, for planning so if you go to safetystanddown.org and you go to that landing page there is a plan your week so for day one it is the recognition of hazards. So it gives you an overview of lithium ion batteries, how they're supposed to behave in their, in their normal environment. Uh, but then it also gets into describing the things like uh, the, when they start to fail. Um, so a general understanding on day one was the foundational part of the way we wanted to get the information out. The second day is our firefighting operations. This is where the bulk of the information that I think, and we all think in our committee, is that's going to be probably the most relevant to our to our uh, partners out there who are participating in safety stand down. That's where the bulk of the content is going to be. And you've referenced a number of the resources already that's listed on the website. There is no shortage, you know, of case studies, of articles, and I would make sure that everybody goes to the Fire Rescue One articles as well to to make sure that uh, that those are are reviewed. Um, day three 
uh, that's where firefighter safety comes into play. So if you're planning out your week, day one, one through five, you know, the, the safety on day three, on day four is the post-incident considerations. So what do you do after the event? Mm -hmm. You know, because you have some partner agencies that are going to be working with you. And then last but not least, day five is public education. This is where you were suggesting that uh, working with the, the community to make sure that they're aware that, that they can make sure that they're not charging their mobility device near the front door of their apartment. We've seen the videos. We've seen it fail. It's almost like a rocket going off. And now you've blocked your means of egress out of your apartment because you've now plugged in your mobility device right by the front door. So making sure that batteries are not overcharged, making sure that they are coming from a reputable, you know, uh, a vendor that, uh, that they are, you know, um, safe for whatever level of safety that you can, you know, ascertain. But I think starting off the week is going to the planning page and then going with the day one through five is going to be a really good start. Like I mentioned before, though, there's also a, a quiz that uh, that those who go to the website can can click on test your knowledge and uh, and then obviously test your knowledge after the fact you know that you can uh, see if you've learned something um, throughout the the week of the uh, the uh, the planning and the the topics yeah and just real quick the um the fire rescue one articles are posted on the safety stand down website as well. So we've got lithium ion training on a budget by Tom Miller with NBFC, and then a step by step for how to incorporate uh, lithium ion battery fire training into the the plan for that week. Um, and then also one other kind of bonus that I just wanted to highlight real quick is uh, the policy side of the house here at Lexapol has also offered free procedures related to lithium ion battery fires. These are not normally free. Normally you have to have <laughs> an arrangement to, with Lexapol, um, but they are offering them for free. And those are those can also be found on the safetysanddown.org resources page or on Fire Rescue One's Safety Sandown page. Thank, thank you to, to Fire Rescue One and Lexapol for that. I mean, it's the SOPs and SOGs, I'm pretty sure that uh, that every department, you know, is challenged with, you know, not only developing, but keeping up with and updating those policies. Because like I said, technology is changing so rapidly, um, it's hard to, to stay up with and uh, to keep those updated. But it's it's very generous from departments out there who have established it and that they can share it with others out there. Um, so that we can we can all learn from each other. And, and as incidences keep coming up, th those policies are going to have to be changed. Uh, as you were saying, the technology is changing so much, and as the batteries continually change, we as a fire service have to continually update those policies. Uh, I, I mean, almost uh, quarterly. Would you not uh, agree? Quarterly, um, you know, as opposed to the past, you might be able to get away with every year. Uh, let's look at these policies now. But I think now with way that UL is helping with data and, and now with the way that technology is changing around us, I mean, what would you suggest on that chief? Like having committee for your department almost with this particular topic? I, I would say that having a committee, whether it's like a, a special operations committee, you know, something that is specific, but I would, I would definitely engage your fire prevention, you know, division to, to make sure that, that whatever, code changes that are happening and i know the code doesn't change very rapidly but but there are going to be some needs for changing our protocols and policies uh our response based on what information is coming out of you know like ul and and some of the other you know institutions out there that are, are focusing on firefighter safety i it's it just, I, I would say it just depends on how rapidly the information is being processed and um, the, the ability for departments to, to kind of keep up on, on that very challenging part of running a department. 
one of the one of the good things we have going for us now are shows like this, Better Every Shift Podcast, and of course Fire Rescue One that they they actually I shouldn't say publicize, but they make these events that when they happen in New York departments on the other coast and down in Sarasota and, and up in, in Wisconsin can look at these particular scenarios and, and learn from them. Right. And then yeah. you had talked about after action, it's imperative for all departments to really be sharing the information. Cause as these keep coming up, um, y- you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, uh, important for all of us. We were just talking as at my own crew, as we were driving around, uh, you know, the, the UV charging stations, some do not have power shutoffs that you can easily locate. And there's no, seems to be no universal, uh, shutoff switch for those. So what happens when someone runs into that and that starts on fire? I mean, uh, you really have to look at your territories and look around you, uh, and have these conversations, uh, correct? Yes. Uh, area orientation, you know, is taking on a whole new meaning you know, when you're now encountering, you know, these EV charging stations, you know, um, even with some of the the most recent in the last few years, knowing that there's a vault, you know, with battery, you know, battery storage units, Mm -hmm. you know, like was uh, over in the surprise Arizona that injured the firefighters, you know, as a result of the failed batteries within that vault. It's knowing your area, pre-planning, taking the resources that are now um, offered in this safety stand down uh, week, and then applying it to the unique, you know, uh, parts of your jurisdiction. The one thing I have heard, especially from um, Chief O'Brien up there in Michigan, a lot of the, the, the vehicle manufacturers are, are now looking to build these large battery um, um, manufacturing plants, huge buildings that are going to be building these these batteries to facilitate the the need for um, these either hybrid vehicles or completely EV vehicles. But then that also, you know, results in a recycling building that's going to store all of the damaged, you know, batteries, which creates a whole new problem in and of itself. So, so yes. Pre-planning, you know, uh, area orientation, knowing where these things are, but then also reaching out to those manufacturers because the manufacturer is going to be unique in how they build their devices and what's unique, you know, for shutting them down. What's the safe way to approach, you know, an incident that could occur at uh, an EV charging station? So it's incumbent on us as the professionals in emergency response is to be as educated as we possibly can, but that is a huge uphill, you know, battle to, to get us there. That you had met like, uh, earlier in the, in the show you mentioned, and not because you're in Sarasota, Florida about the scooters that, that, uh, people take, I mean, I'm they're they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, probably, probably a little bit more in Florida, but that's for another conversation. Right. But, uh, you have, you have both, um, you know, you have those scooters, you have those hoverboards, you have the e-bikes, which I know we're seeing up in in um, in Madison, where I I live. Switching from the UV side or from the from the EV side, these are what we're really seeing within the households. Then, um, you know, so we have the hazards on the road, we have the hazards in the household, and and I just want to reiterate the point you had brought up was. If you're charging these in your doorway or your back door uh, area, or you know, in a, in a in a an area where there's egress, if that starts on fire, you've now just trapped yourself in a way. Yeah, you you've now put yourself in a position where you're going to have to go with plan plan B, C, or D. Which a lot of times, especially like we've seen in New York, there aren't you know good options. Um, and that's where we've seen loss of life and injuries. Um, and those things happen quickly and violently. Um, so understanding there's there's a public education component to this. So, so we're gonna be challenging our public information officer with making sure that the message is going out to, to our residents and, and uh, you know, the, the people of Sarasota County is to consider 
where you're charging your mm. your device, whether it is your you know batteries for your lawn equipment or whether it is your scooter or whether it is that brand new bike that's got a battery pack on it so that it's you have to be aware that there's some safety consideration when you're when you're charging this and especially if the battery is is not a completely you know um good and working properly battery yeah and and if you wipe out too i mean what does that do to the battery you know yep. um uh, have you guys seen, have you seen personally some, some close calls already with that? So down here in Sarasota, I, I haven't been made aware of it. Um, I know that we on a regular basis have had calls, you know, that were associated with, you know, um, whether it's, uh, Tesla's or, you know, EVs, uh, we have had a recent fire in an RV where there was a battery array, you know, kind of like an off the grid sort of a an approach to someone's uh class a motorhome and the batteries did fail which resulted in um our crews needing to stand by on batteries that that were still you know being affected and and so having them in a 55 gallon drum with water you know while we sit there and watch the the gas bubbles come up mm. um and making sure that uh, things were at least stable and safe before we cleared the scene. It, it does happen from time to time, but uh, nothing like we're seeing like in the apartments in New York and, uh, and our, our friends up there have experience with, with the things that they've seen. Yeah. We have a, a, a big a campus area or college uh, town too. And, and we're seeing some uh, computers that have started. Oh, there we go. Almost lost. Yeah, there it is. <coughs> there it is. Uh, yeah. The lights are back on there. I have Jeez. to stay animated uh, to, to keep the lights on in this room. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've seen the um, e-bikes and uh, uh, computers and, and some overloading of, of outlets and uh, of, of power strips. And um, I think we have one kind of unconfirmed case where a bike e-bike was uh, brought inside in the in a back stairwell that possibly burn through and um and it's just a matter of time Our, i i think uh, these lithium ion batteries are going to keep us busy in the in the near future that's i'm sure they will and then who knows what's next you know well considering the plethora of resources we've talked about today and how clearly important this topic is what do you say to people who are like we don't have time to devote, you know, we don't have time to deal with the stand down. We've got other stuff going on or we don't know where to begin. What would you say to them? Well, I, I would say that where to begin is, is taking that first step. Um, I know that everybody in, you know, the fire service around the country, whether you are career or volunteer, um, there are so many things that our, our personnel are being asked to do. I mean, never more have we recognized, you know, the, the amount of effort, you know, coming out of the pandemic and the responsibility for our folks to, to train um, and having listened to the podcast with the gold fetters, you know, kind of like every day is a training day, you know, uh, sort of an approach. We, there, there are, there are things that our community requires us to, to be up on. Um, they have high expectations of us. And when we, you know, um, look at how we do our business, it's, it's all for Mrs. Smith. You know, it's the approach that we're here for public safety, but we're here for service. And so the first step I believe is making sure that your department, um, is aware that there is such thing as a safety stand down and that it is formalized. Um, we here in Sarasota County are going to observe it in a way that uh, it's going to be tracked, you know, on our LMS, on our learning management system, that we're going to be able to track everyone who participates in our uh, safety stand down, provide all of the planning for the week's events. And on the days that our crews are on shift, they can carve out a part of their day 
um, to to focus on on learning something about lithium ion batteries, the background, the operations, the safety, and then the uh, what we do after the incident, and and by all means, you know, uh, try to educate our our public when we go on an emergency call or we go on a EMS call and we see a you know a scooter plugged in near the front door, it's a learning opportunity for us to to share that with uh, with those those folks. So taking the first step is usually the, the hardest part, but once departments get on board with it and know that they have resources out there, um, it gets easier and easier. Chief, how do you guys uh, as a committee, how do you as a committee determine whether you're successful with the safety stand on or not? That's the $64,000 question right there. <laughs> um, I know that um, from all of the partner agencies, they are all in agreement that this is probably the biggest um, topic that is being asked about, you know, not only at, uh, you know, from the safety, health and survival board side, but also from the National Volunteer Fire Council and the Fire Department Safety Officers Association, that NFPA has a plethora of information related to this response. Um, and then obviously with the IAFF, um, though the partners that we have here, measuring success for us is the is our ability to put the information out there. And then um, I mean, we, we can track things like how many, you know, web page visits that we receive or or how many people take the quiz, how many you know, how many people put in for the sweepstakes for a challenge coin, you know, if they if they take the quiz. There's these little things that we can measure, but ultimately it's, you know, it's a very challenging thing to, to try to figure out if we were successful or not. Um, one of the things that we do have on the website are success stories. So one of the ways that we can measure, you know, is is by departments individual departments out there who participate in safety stand down and they have a success story they can submit those to us that we can publish and then we can actually get some some real good feedback and understand how the work that we've done collaboratively has been um, used by by departments across the country and we've even had a couple outside the country who have uh, also uh, mentioned that they're excited about this year's safety stand down. That's great. Well, for what it's worth, Chief, I'm going to be talking about it uh, this week. I get to go to New York Fire Chiefs, so I'll be talking about our conversation. And uh, personally, I I just looking at all the information and kind of getting a, a little bit of a a preview of it. Um, as somebody who is new to training and someone who's been in the fire service for 15 years, I it's the resources you have there. Um, are incredible. And I think any department uh, should be using them often and talking about them. And if anything, um, just coming on and having uh, you here talking about this, I, hopefully our, our listeners are now going to that website um, and, and looking at all of those various resources and then talking about them with their crews, bringing them back to their departments. So we really appreciate you coming on all your effort into those resources, but you're not done yet, chief. Um, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna throw you in the hot seat. We like to, to lighten things up and, and get to know you a little bit more and, uh, use your knowledge of the fire service. We have questions and the running joke is that a lot of the questions come from Janelle's mom and my mom, who are our two favorite listeners. They're not <laughs> our two only listeners anymore. Uh, but our, our favorite listeners and uh, Janelle has some great ones for you. She's going to lead you off today. All right. All right. Hot seat is appropriate for this question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you have gone from Arizona to Florida. Uh, clearly you are drawn to heat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> potentially blistering, blistering heat. <laughs> so I'm curious, what do you prefer? A dry heat? Or a human heat? Oh, goodness. Um, so I will say, having lived in Tucson, Arizona for a little over 25 years, and having lived in Sarasota for almost one year, 
we did arrive during the July of last year. And so I would gladly, you know, trade the deserts of Arizona and it being 115 degrees outside for for Sarasota County and being able to spend my uh, weekends at the beach. So Florida, um, sorry to all my my Tucson folks, um, <laughs> but it is, uh, you just have to, to be here to know. I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> all it's right. A dry, it's a dry, it's a dry, it's a dry, dry yes. It's a dry but it's not I love that. still terrible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. I would, I'm curious, just on our safety theme, do you have a safety issue like with your friends or family that is a constant in your household? I know in my household, it was all about driving. We'd hear about that from my dad all the time. Don't speed, don't speed. What's, what's it in your household? Well, I'm, I'm going to have to to say that driving happens to be the other one in our family because having been a, a, paramedic and a firefighter for a little over 30 years now. I think I drive magnificently. Um, but my wife will remind me that my driving is more like me going code three to a, to a house fire than it, than it would be if we were just going over to the grocery store. So I would say that my driving happens to be the, the safety issue that, uh, that she would probably also echo that same sentiment. Well, they go fast down in Florida. <laughs> I, my parents are my parents are just south of of Sarasota there, and they, it's it's crazy. Like there's they they like drive fast there too. So you have to keep up, right? You Chief? do. I mean, it's, it's you absolutely do. Um, so, uh, speaking of keeping up, you have uh, put forth so much effort, and passion into safety stand down. Uh, what are the other things? Uh, you know, what's your other major passion? What are you passionate about right now? So uh, I'm passionate um, on the fire service side of things. Um, it's always been, at least for the last probably, oh, nine years or so, um, working on uh, research and prevention for uh, fire service cancer. So the Tucson Fire Department had a tremendous opportunity going back to 2015 to be a part of a grant uh, that was in partnership with the University of Arizona. Um, Palm Beach County here in Florida, and then Boston Fire. So being one of the three departments in the country, uh, being in the firefighter cancer cohort study uh, was a tremendous um, opportunity for us to not only um, make strides in cancer research and prevention, but also to at least have a small part in, in some of the satisfaction that we experienced last year when IARC changed the classification for the occupation of, of uh, firefighting to be a class one um, carcinogenic occupation. There was research and studies that we got to participate in that there was a level of validation of the work that we were doing. Um, and so that's, that's the other passion that I have, as well as uh, having been a cancer survivor, that kind of keeps you motivated to make sure that that we do everything possible to to try and prevent the uh, cancer from from affecting all of our firefighter brothers and sisters out there. And we appreciate that work because there's a lot to be done there too. Um, very similar themes with lithium ion batteries and cancer. Very very um, pertinent but uh, challenging topics. So uh, I think we we noticed a theme that you like the challenges and you like uh, kind of uh, more trying situations. Um, and my last question then is, so for somebody who embraces this challenge, um, what would you like to convey on to our listeners about what does it really mean to be better every shift? So I'm, I'm a big believer that, um, if you're not growing, you're dying. You can't just coast, um, continual improvement. I mean, that's why, that's probably why for me, there, there isn't really ever going to be a retirement. There's just going to be what's next, you know? So for, for those uh, out there that I get to uh, partner with, work with, mentor, for those who ask me, what, what can I do? Um, I, I say, take every opportunity to learn. Um, if, 
If you're seeking to have influence in the fire service, uh, get involved. You know, specifically, my experience was uh, with the IAFC getting into the the staging, you know, um, a group where you can participate at some level, and then ultimately, you know, uh, get out there outside of your department and interact with firefighters in other departments. And that is easily done by attending, you know, conferences. And uh, so like whether it's FRI, FDIC, the Fire Department Safety Officers Association conference that's in St. Pete's, you know, it was here this year. And then next year it'll be in Scottsdale and they flip flop. There's no substitute for networking out there to make connections with others, because if you don't have the answer, somebody else may have that answer. So it's just, you just got to keep plugging along. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And you, you just have to continually challenge yourself to, you know, to bring your A game and, uh, and keep, uh, keep up with uh, the expectation of, of doing what's right for the people that you serve. Perfect summary. Great way to end it. Uh, for those uh, that want to just take the first step, actually go to safetystanddown.org, share that information with someone else uh, on your crew, right? Share that information with your department. Um, so I think very well said, Chief, thank you so much for being here. Uh, again, go to safetystanddown.org for all the great resources. Make sure you share that information. You can also go to Better Every Shift at firerescue1.com. Uh, you can see the YouTube version of this, so you can watch the lights go out on Chief once or twice <laughs> with uh, <laughs> um, uh, with the automatic shutoff there that we we overcame. We adapted and overcame that. Um, you can rate us also, and please rate us. Uh, please uh, let us know how we're doing here, what we can do to improve if you have questions for our hot seat. Uh, but most importantly, everybody, make sure you learn something, do something, share something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thanks for listening, everybody.